it is remembered as one of the most monumental events in modern history. The fall of the Berlin Wall. It was such a joyous moment that many people forgot. The entire world was on the brink that night. An East German soldier reveals for the first time how perilously close the world came to unimaginable disaster. This could have very easily turned into World War III. For decades, the wall divides East from West. And the stakes are never higher than during that night when the fate of the world hangs in the balance. I felt just a sense of disbelief. This couldn't be happening. Not tonight. With original state security surveillance films, we reveal what happened when the wall came down. The Berlin Wall, an icon of the Cold War for nearly 30 years. We all remember, I think, what Churchill said in the famous speech at Westminster when he said, an iron curtain has descended across Europe. And the Berlin Wall, of course, was the most obvious example. Since the end of World War II, this borderline has divided the capitalist societies of Western Europe from the communist bloc nations in the East. Nowhere is the separation more dramatic than in East Germany, the German Democratic Republic, or GDR, where a fault line known as the Berlin Wall runs right through the capital city. After World War II, up to 1961, when the Berlin Wall went up, there was a mass exodus of people from the Soviet sector of Berlin to West Berlin. And in order to stop that exodus, the wall went up. So great is the desire to flee the East, only a 12-foot heavily guarded wall can keep the population locked down. Over the decades, some still dare to escape. A handful make it. 220 people die trying. In the shadow of the Berlin Wall, a vast state security apparatus strikes fear in people's hearts. The secret state police, the Stasi, ruthlessly weed out anti-communists. There are random arrests in broad daylight and long prison terms for those planning an escape. There's a dawning sense of hope when Mikhail Gorbachev becomes the leader of the Soviet Union. And I had had some meetings with Gorbachev and they did not think that they would be using force to keep the empire together. President Ronald Reagan quickly puts the new Soviet leader to the test. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. It looks like this dream might become a reality when in the summer of 1989, the first hole appears in the Iron Curtain. It was the Hungarians who took the first step on May 2nd, 1989. I will never forget it. They cut the fence with large bolt cutters. As one of the few countries East Germans are allowed to visit, Hungary is a traditional vacation spot for them. In the summer of 1989, thousands of East Germans head there with no intention of going home. Every day, dozens of refugees find the hole in the Iron Curtain and escape into Austria. The trip itself was risky. There were real dangers involved in it. So it certainly was a dangerous journey. other young East Germans, Robert Krause and his girlfriend Jana, have spent their whole lives under communist rule. But they're willing to risk it all for a new life in the West. I will never forget this trip. It was goodbye to East Germany and goodbye to my youth. Robert and Jana have made plans for a daring escape. 
Und da sind wir also auf diesen Hof drauf gefahren. We were waiting in a parking lot in this industrial park. Wir sind im Auto sitzen geblieben. Two Austrian women have agreed to smuggle the young couple to the west in their cars. Robert Krause and Jana met them in a restaurant only a few days earlier. Wir kriegen ja immer nur einen ins Auto und deshalb haben wir uns gedacht, Robert und ich, wir fahren zuerst. Und Jana und Ruth kommen eine Stunde später nach. Ja, und dann treffen wir uns auf der anderen Seite, Ruth weiß wo. Well, and then I had to say goodbye to Jana and Jana. Okay, los. On the one hand, I was afraid for myself. Andererseits hatte ich Angst vor Jana. Hand, I was about Jana. Dass ich If I got through, there was no guarantee that she would get through. Ich liebe dich. Das schaffen. Konnte ja sein, dass wir getrennt werden für viele Jahre. It was possible that we would get separated for many years. If something went wrong, I could get three or five years in prison, or maybe even get shot. And so I crawled into the car, and then I felt how terribly tight this was. I could not move at all. The other option that East Germans who wanted to leave East Germany had was to go to one of the Federal Republic of Germany embassies. We heard alarming stories of the numbers of people that would show up at the embassies both in Prague and in Budapest trying to get in in hopes that there would be some way that they could get to West Germany. My concern was would there be independent reaction on the part of the military authorities and police authorities? Would people start reacting on their own? Which of course would cause a very volatile situation. Thilo Koch is a cadet in the East German Army's elite border protection division. He is assigned to officer training school at Zul. 200 miles south of Berlin. We were soldiers, prospective officers. We were there voluntarily. We were patriots, trying to protect our country. I would have given my life. Of course, we knew that East Germany was going through a rough period. There were economic problems, but also social issues that surfaced. But I thought, these are temporary problems, which we will be able to overcome. East German Robert Krause is now on his way to the border. I did not know when we were actually at the border crossing. I was just trying to fend off their coughing fit. And then I heard steps coming around the car, and then the trunk opened. And when I heard this, I was thinking, now we are at the border, keep it together. And then I heard the step coming further around the car, and he opened the car door, and the blanket shifted, and I knew he had seen me. And I opened my eyes and saw the face of a border guard in his hat, and I knew it was over. East German refugee Robert Krause has been caught trying to escape from behind the Iron Curtain. They pulled me out, and I stood there not knowing what was going on, and the first thing I did was raise my hands. I was... paralyzed. I did not realize who these people were. I did not hear what they were saying to me. It was as if a bomb had exploded. I did not hear anything anymore. This is all that I have. Bitte, lassen Sie mich durch. I took out a note I had written and 100 marks, and I gave it to them. And the first border guard took the piece of paper and looked at it, and then he looked at me as if I'd come from a different planet. Sie haben es geschafft. 
Sie sind im Westen. Willkommen in Österreich. Ja! It was a real shock, and I jumped in his arms. This poor Austrian border guard was totally overwhelmed. He just stood there, and I was hugging him and was only screaming with joy. So here I was, on the right side. And then we drove into Austria. And we waited. And it was an eternity. And when the car appeared, the shocking thing was, the woman who was smuggling her, she was alone in the car. And I jumped up and ran to the car. She hardly had stopped the car. I opened the trunk. And then the fruit rolled to the side, and Yana crawled out. I hadn't seen her. And this reunion was mind-blowing. We fell into each other's arms. I swung her around and I screamed. We had made it. <laughs> Over the summer, 13,000 East Germans have escaped to the West through Hungary. Desperate to stop the hemorrhaging, the government suspends all travel visas. Thousands take to the streets in protest. As we got into the latter part of August and into September and early October, uh, I became very well aware of the demonstrations that were occurring in Dresden and Leipzig and other cities in East Germany. The people demand reform. They want freedom, especially the freedom to travel. The demonstrators know they're putting their lives on the line. Totalitarian states can't allow internal unrest. We were very curious as to what the East German government reaction was going to be. Eric Honecker, at the time the General Secretary, was probably the last staunch supporter of the hard line. Of course, there were some members in the Politburo who wanted to smash the demonstrations. Gunter Schabowski is the ranking Communist Party leader in Berlin and one of the youngest members of the Politburo. There were people in the Politburo, especially the younger ones, who thought, this can't go on like this. We have to change things so people don't risk their lives trying to flee our republic. We knew this would be hard with Honecker at the helm. Four weeks after the first demonstration, 20,000 people take to the streets in Leipzig. And now, East German police are cracking down hard. Suddenly, the people behind us started running. And I thought, no problem, they won't catch you. But they did. They dragged me in the back of a car and brought me to the state security service prison in Beethoven's Trasse. Thousands of refugees have been holed up in Prague's West German embassy for over a month now. The situation is about to reach a boiling point. This just came from Prague. What is it? It's scheduled speaking to the refugees inside the embassy. 1989, I was a radio correspondent and a stringer for ABC News. It was late in the evening when the first pictures rolled in of the West German Foreign Minister Genscher on that balcony in Prague. And suddenly, there's this roar from these refugees. And they all look at me because I'm the only one who speaks German. He said that they're free to leave. They will be allowed to come to West Germany on trains. But the thing is, they will have to travel over East German territory. If these trains were going through the East German territory, a lot could happen. A lot could go wrong. Maybe they want to stop that. I actually thought that if they were going to shut down this entire movement, they would do it with those trains. They would just stop them. If they do that, the whole place would blow up.
throngs of East Germans rushed to the Dresden train station, hoping to force their way aboard the Freedom Trains. Police are there to meet them. You were seeing East German riot police with helmets and shields and batons battling with the East German population that were trying to get onto these trains. Inside the station, hundreds of demonstrators corner a group of police. Officers use tear gas to hold the crowd at bay. And still, the protest grows. A lady with a handbag was walking up to a police line and the East German policeman with a baton hitting her and I realized that this was potentially not going to end well. And when the Molotov cocktails were starting to fly, dozens of East German police in riot gear were engulfed in flames. It looked like this was going to be civil war. As thousands of East German refugees travel by train from Prague to West Germany, a riot breaks out at the Dresden railway station. The train speeds straight through and make it safely to the west. A major blow for the communist leaders in East Berlin. Two days after the Battle of Dresden, Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev is due to arrive in East Berlin for the GDR's 40th birthday celebration. The 40th anniversary was extremely important for us, especially for East German leader Erich Honecker. This was 40 years of his work that he was celebrating. Journalists gather at East Berlin's airport, where Honecker awaits Gorbachev's arrival. I yelled out to Erich Honecker and asked him, Mr. Honecker. Honecker, we feel like today morning. No, out of sight. Then I saw him yesterday. I feel me like in Berlin already. And he had this little spring in his body, and uh, I thought it's very curious that he would say something like this on a day like that, when his country was bleeding out, and he didn't see it. But his visitor knows that change is unavoidable. They were talking about perestroika and glasnost. There was some chance that they would not, as other Soviet uh, leaders had done, use force to keep the empire together. I think Gorbachev was smart enough to realize that there was an end to the Warsaw Pact. It was an end to the Iron Curtain. It could no longer survive. And then he said what would become the slogan of the century. He said, those who act too late will be punished by history. Despite the Soviet leader's urgings, the East German regime uses the occasion to mount a display of their military might. Among the legions of soldiers, Tilo Koch. I don't know whether that was planned, but we did not have any contact to the outside world at that time. No more phone calls were allowed, no radio and no TV. This had the effect that we did not know about what was going on in the country, about the problems. That sunny morning, all seems well in Erich Honecker's East Germany. Shortly after noon, Thilo Koch's unit is on the way back to their barracks. I was on top of the world. I knew we had done a good job. It was a little bit like passing a final exam. Very difficult exam. So we were cheering. 
and dancing on the truck. One of them tied two steel helmets around their chests, very similar to two female breasts. We came back to our base beaming with joy. Then the tarp was lifted. Somebody yelled orders through a megaphone. You could hear a helicopter. Jeeps were passing by. Dogs were barking the bed. Our commanding officer arrived. And he said that this is for real. This is not a drill. And when I looked at the other soldiers, you could just see the shock and emptiness in their eyes. It felt like this was going to be doomsday. Koch and his fellow soldiers have reason to be on edge. Shortly after Gorbachev leaves for Moscow, the East German birthday party has come to a sobering end. The evening of Gorbachev's departure, there was a very, very large demonstration that occurred at Alexander Platz. Within minutes, police and army units descend on the scene, ready to confront the demonstrators. And we realize this is the crackdown. They're now coming to shut down this demonstration. They're going to take this down. Journalist Andreas Gutzeit watches as the Stasi, the secret state security service, brutally arrests dozens of protesters. Then suddenly, they turn on him. It all went very, very fast and very, very quickly. Journalist Andreas Grutzeit is covering a violent demonstration in East Germany. When suddenly the secret state police, the Stasi, come after him. I fell forward with a bag with my microphone scattered into the street, and they saw that I was a journalist. And they started kicking me, punching me, and two hefty, Stasi goons picked me up and dragged me over into the police station. I was walked down this hallway, and at the end of it was a holding room. Sie sollen sich hinsetzen. I was sitting there for a while. Nobody came for an hour, an hour and a half. At some point, I realized that I still had my bag with my notebook. And in my notebook, I had the phone numbers that I had called to speak with members of the opposition. And I decided to be on the safe side and ripped out the pages and ate them. And at some point the door opened, a man walked in, didn't say a word. Hey, I'm a, I'm an official accredited journalist. Für eine amerikanische Fernsehanstalt. Sie haben keinerlei Recht, mich hier festzuhalten. Soll ich es mir holen oder oder geben Sie es mir freiwillig? I remember that sort of shock that you feel is like, oh my God, I forgot the tape. But in the face of this gentleman. The way he looked at me, he was clear that there was no use of not giving this tape to me.
was sollen wir nun mit ihm tun? Wie wäre es mit einem Ausflug? At around two in the morning, they put me in a car, and I hoped they would drive me to the west, but I was wrong. Meanwhile, Tilo Kopp's unit is also on the road. They have been driving for over four hours. We were silent the entire time. Nobody knew where we were going. Nobody even knew why. The only thing we knew was that something big must have happened. An hour before dawn, Koch's unit arrives at their destination. They are ordered to this additional vacancy. But this is not just another military installation. One of us recognized the place. He had been there as a child. It was a vacation camp for children. There were monkey bars and sandboxes and toys. But instead of going to sleep, the soldiers find themselves in a room with a film projector. We were watching film footage of the Hungarian uprising. Very harsh shots, which we had not expected at all. Soldiers were dead in the street, corpses were burning. And then they showed us pictures from China. Two soldiers in a truck were stopped and stoned to death by an angry mob. I will never forget that. And then a general came up on stage. Das hier ist ein Soldat, der vor sechs Monaten in China auf dem Platz des himmlischen Friedens für den Sozialismus gekämpft hat. Seht genau hin. Ein China darf es bei uns nicht geben. Aber Freunde, es gibt es schon. Hier in unserer Heimat. Then we saw those pictures from Dresden. In Dresden, in these days, it was a shock. The mob regiert die Straße. We saw these police units and civilians running. Something was burning. It looked just like China in Hungary. The country is in danger. Seid ihr bereit, für eure Heimat zu kämpfen? Euch diesen subversiven Elementen entgegenzustellen? Es gab niemanden. There was nobody who remained seated. Diesen Verbrechern! When this general was finished, we were fired up, like dogs, released from a chain. We are driving through East Berlin for what at first seemed like an eternity. It was first 10 minutes, and then it was 20 minutes, and then it was a half hour. And I was like, this is not the way to the West. And that's when the car stopped. And I sat there and... Ich gebe Ihnen eine Minute. And I was very afraid. I was very afraid. Stasi officers have driven journalist Andreas Goodsight to a secluded area outside of East Berlin. The journalist fears for his life. Heinrich Heine Straße. 
When he said Heinrich Heine Straße, I knew that the game was over. They were going to drive me to the West. I remember that that was the moment that I realized that this whole thing was a game. It was a game that they played with me to scare me, to assert their authority, and to show that they were in control. And it worked. Emboldened by the powerful demonstration in Berlin, protesters take to the streets in other East German cities. We all were surprised about the size of the crowd. Uh, and given the size of the crowd, the peacefulness of the demonstration. But the East German government will not give up without a fight. Police and the Stasi violently attack the demonstrators. The risk of a bloody takedown was ever present. Immediately after the 40th anniversary, it became clear that Eric Honecker was considering military steps. But Gunther Schabowski and a handful of other moderate communist leaders realized that a military confrontation with their own people could have disastrous consequences. During the next meeting of the Politburo, they demand Honecker's resignation. And to their surprise, he steps down without a fight. I was relieved. It's not every day that you get to topple a general secretary. It's almost blasphemous. And now we thought we could open a dialogue with the demonstrators. But hardliners in the military refuse to stand down. Kilo Cox unit is already training for a massive clash with the demonstrators. There were shields and batons waiting for us. The unit was divided into A and B. One unit was supposed to be the mob, the terrorist. And we were the ones who had to defend the streets. And then we started training. We were angry. Our enemy was the angry mob. They were crazy. Apparently, we were the only level-headed people left who had to save our country. Time is running out for the East German regime. 500,000 protesters take to the streets in Leipzig. Against that many people, the Stasi is powerless. That same night, Koch's army unit is ordered to mount up. They are armed to the teeth. When it came to live ammunition, they usually kept pretty close records of the barracks. This no longer mattered now. Someone counted our ammunition. It was two and a half times the amount that would have been handed out in the event of a world war. We could have leveled the entire city of Berlin. We had packed as much ammunition as we could carry. We felt like crusading knights.
Tension throughout East Germany is reaching a fever pitch, not only on the streets, but in the Communist Party headquarters, where moderates like Gunter Schabowski lock horns with hardliners in the military establishment. With the future of the nation at stake, the government makes a desperate gamble and offers the people a concession. Also Privatreisen nach dem Ausland können ohne Vorliegen von Voraussetzungen Reiseanlässe und Verwandtschaftsverhältnisse beantragt werden. Die Genehmigungen werden kurzfristig erteilt. The government hopes this move will serve as a pressure valve. Little do they know, they've just opened the floodgates. Das tritt nach meiner Kenntnis ist das sofort. Unverzüglich. But Schabowski has spoken too soon. The border patrol hasn't had any advance warning, and the military is still in the dark. There was an embargo on the release of this information. A broadcaster was to read this text at 4 a.m. in the middle of the night. And now I was doing exactly that around 7 p.m. So people all over the world heard it at 7.45 p.m. But only two miles away from where I was speaking, the Border Patrol had no idea. Within the hour, hundreds of West Berliners show up at the border crossing known as Checkpoint Charlie. They've seen Schabowski's announcement on the evening news. I received a call from the, our non-commissioned officer in charge at Checkpoint Charlie. He had called me at home and asked me if I had heard anything at all about uh, the East Germans opening up the control points. I thought I better get out to Checkpoint Charlie because if something is going to happen, that will be a focal point of activity. As they're dispatched to the border, Tilo Koch and his men know nothing of their leadership's surprise announcement. We arrived at Checkpoint Charlie. We took up positions on our side of the border crossing. His superiors also have no clue what is going on. They just know that a large number of people have climbed on top of the wall. Im Westen stehen tausende Demonstranten. Ihre Aufgabe ist es, das Staatsgebiet der DDR zu schützen. And he continued saying that even on the eastern side, there are 5,000 people that want to get out. Lassen Sie Stellung beziehen. They repeated the order to hold the border. It wasn't until a bit later in the evening, uh, I would say once we got to the 8.30, 9 o'clock, 9.30 time frame, where we started seeing trucks show up with extra border guards in it and being deployed in additional numbers along that area adjacent to Checkpoint Charlie. We saw regular army, regular East German army soldiers, not border guards, Two hours after the announcement, and still nobody's told the East German soldiers to stand down. They are still under orders to kill anyone trying to get in or out of the country. If these people were going to attempt an assault on the borders of the East German Democratic Republic, we would have to take action. And that's why we had the weapons. This was a very dangerous situation. This could end in a bloody catastrophe. At the East German checkpoint, Kopp and his fellow cadets are totally isolated. They try to reach their commanding officer, but can't get through. The lines are overwhelmed. Every unit stationed along the wall tries in vain to get clear orders from headquarters. We had to hold the line. Those were our instructions. Hold the line until the very end. We had been told that Soviet troops were coming. Outside, 
thousands of East Berliners converge on the border crossings. The East German soldiers now have to defend the wall against demonstrators coming from the West and their own countrymen in the East. That couldn't be true. What did this mean for us? What were we supposed to do? It said that the borders were going to be opened. Thilo Koch has to make a decision. Will he carry out his orders and shoot anybody trying to cross the border? Or will he concede to the power of the people? He chooses the latter. There is a point where everybody had to decide when it was time to give up. That just comes from within. That's us. This is einfach da. This feeling. The feeling that it's over. It's just there. That is all. That is the whole secret. 10:30 p.m. East German border officers open the checkpoints. The Berlin Wall has finally come down. You couldn't help but get involved. In an absolutely historical event. This revolution had reached the brink. Bloodshed was imminent. Everyone, protesters and police, politicians and Stasi alike, decided that there will not be any violence. So that's the real miracle of November 9th, that everything happened the way it did. It was the first time in German history that a peaceful revolution changed the world. That November 9th and the collapse of the wall was the biggest symbol that the Cold War was coming to an end. For me, this was a huge day for Germany and the rest of the world. It was peaceful, and we are now looking at a completely different future.